Additional thyreophora groups include the ankylosaurs. These are really heavily armored dinosaurs. And uh, so they're, um, uh, they're big, they're heavy, they're, um, they have this armor, of course, to defend against predators. And uh, we actually break down the ankylosaurs into two different groups. There's the notosaurines to begin with, and these guys do not have a tail club. And their head is more elongate. And so this is what he's going to look like. And there you can see no club on the back of the tail. And uh, it's a kind of a long, more elongate head. I always thought this was the type of dinosaur I wanted to like ride into battle on because it just looks really cool. Uh, and you really could because there's the size of it, right? It's not huge. Uh, there's our six foot person. So we could ride into battle on these uh, Notosaurus. Um, but that's one type of um, uh, uh, these dinosaurs, these Ankylosaurus. Um, in addition, we actually have the Ankylosaur group in there. And these guys do have a big heavy tail club on them, and their head is not quite as elongated. It's sort of squished together a little bit more, so it's more triangular. And another way that they're different from the Notosaurines is if you actually look in the skull and look at the nasal passages, there's some differences in the, uh, in the nasal passages of the skull. And this is our uh, ankylosaur, and uh, you can see that it has a more triangular head to it, and it's got this huge bony um, uh, tail to it. And if you see me look off screen, it's because my cat is getting into mischief and I have to try to keep him out of it. He's about ready to jump on my computer and like, who knows what he'd do to my presentation here. So anyway, this is a typical size of an ankylosaur. And um, uh, you can see again, compared to a six foot person there. Now, Marginocephalia is another one of these ornithischian groups that we have. They only exist in the Cretaceous, and they all have some kind of bony structures on part of their skull. And that's what keep, makes them all uh, uh, in common. And uh, one of these Marginocephalia groups is Pachycephalosauria. And uh, these are a bipedal herbivore. They walk on two legs and they have very thick bones on the top of their skull and they have very, very strong vertebrae in their necks. In addition to that, along the backbone, their tendons are ossified. That means they're hardened. And that's because these guys like to butt heads, sort of like uh, um, what is it, mountain sheep uh, like to do, and it probably was for the same reason, fighting over, um, um, you know, um, mates of whatever kind, and anyway, these guys would headbutt each other, and that's why they have all this hardened and beefy, burlier stuff in their neck and vertebrae, and, um, this is one of the uh, types of uh, Pachycephalosaurus, and that happens to be Pachycephalosaurus. And there you can have an idea of um, just how big they could get. Now, in addition to uh, the Pachycephalosaurus, we also have the um, Ceratopsia um, dinosaurs in this group that has these bony structures uh, on their skull. And one of these is uh, called Psittacosauridae. And uh, this name actually refers to like parrots. And uh, you'll probably see in a moment why it gets the name of like the parrot uh, dinosaur. And uh, so these guys are little and they're speedy. They're small and fast. They have a beaked mouth and they have a tiny little frill on the back of their uh, skull. And that's what these guys would look like. I think um, he's so ugly, he's cute, and I would like him as a pet. But anyway, there's the really tiny frill on the back of their skull. Yes, they did have these weird little quill structures sticking out. Uh, we know that because those are preserved in some fossils. And that's what this guy looked like. And
and he was pretty small. He wasn't a humongous dinosaur, so really I do think he'd be a kind of cool pet to have. But the ones that people are more familiar with in the uh, ceratopsids are the Neoceratopsia dinosaurs. These are quadrupedal. They, are, um, they have a prominent frill, a very prominent growth of the, uh, out the back of their skull. They oftentimes have horns. And these were actually among the last of the dinosaurs other than birds. So if we kind of ignore that birds evolved from dinosaurs, these guys were sort of the last ones to survive. And a good example is Triceratops. I think most people are familiar with Triceratops with its horns, and there's that prominent frill uh, out the back of their, uh, their skull. And these could be quite large. Now, not all Triceratops would be this big. As this says, this is a large one uh, compared to our uh, six-foot guy. Some of them would be a little bit smaller than that. So there's our Triceratops. So that's a, a brief introduction to the different groups or families of dinosaurs that we have. But there are other interesting things to consider about dinosaurs in addition to just like what did they look like and, and what's their family tree like. There's been a, a long-standing debate on whether they are warm or cold-blooded. Um, endothermic versus ectothermic. So endothermic is the fancy way of saying warm-blooded. Ectothermic is the fancy way of saying cold-blooded. So here are some of the arguments. They're reptiles, and reptiles are cold-blooded. So dinosaurs should be cold-blooded. Well, but... They share features with birds. Birds are warm-blooded, so they are warm-blooded. Well, warm-bloodedness was first proposed in the 1860s by Thomas Huxley, and then it was revived by Bob Backer back in the 1970s. So the warm-blooded, uh, cold-blooded debate really has been going on for a long time. So we have to look at more than just the reptile-bird relationship. Let's look at some other lines of evidence people have pursued to try to figure out if they're warm or cold-blooded. Well, they look at the structure of the limbs. And warm-blooded organisms tend to have legs that come straight out from under us. Remember, in most reptiles, like think of looking at, um, at a crocodile or an alligator, their legs kind of stick out to the side and they move a little bit differently. And so people looked at the limb structure and say they look kind of like warm-blooded, uh, so maybe they're warm-blooded. We also look at the internal structure of bone. So when you look at the, the bone structure and how many um, like blood vessels are in there and other stuff, um, warm-blooded and cold-blooded organisms look different. And the dinosaurs tend to have a structure that looks quite a bit like warm-bloodedness. But back when I was in college, there was this absolutely evil study that was done. And what someone did was they got a whole bunch of iguanas, which are cold-blooded reptiles. And they had a control group where they just let it like live an iguana lifestyle. And then they had a group of iguanas that they forced them to exercise every day. They like made them run on treadmills or something. And then at the end of this study, after, you know, a while of letting these guys grow, they killed them all, which is where I, where I think it's kind of evil there. But they killed them all. And then they looked at the bone structure and they found out that the iguanas that exercised had a bone structure that looked a lot like a warm blooded organism, even though they were were cold-blooded. And so what that ended up suggesting is, well, maybe dinosaurs were cold-blooded, but they just exercised a lot. They were just very active. And so that kind of, you know, this could go either way. That's what I'm trying to get at. All right, so respiratory turbinates. This is, again, some kind of structure in, in the uh, nasal passages and things. And uh, there is reptiles and warm-blooded organisms have and have nots and unfortunately some dinosaurs have these some do not so it doesn't really tell us much. Uh, bone isotopes, the the isotopes of different elements that make up the bone. 
uh, can vary depending on warm or cold bloodedness. Again, that's not exactly, um, uh, there's nothing unequivocal in there. And you can also look at the ratio of predator to prey. In ecosystems dominated by warm blooded organisms, you have kind of 3% predator, 97% prey. In cold blooded, we have a different ratio. But of course, that's difficult when the fossil record is incomplete to actually see exactly what our ratio might have been. So, in conclusion, are dinosaurs warm or cold blooded? Well, it's inconclusive. We don't actually know until that time machine over in my garage is finished um, and I can go and I guess, you know, check it out. Um, we, we just don't have the answer. So possibly somewhere endothermic, possibly somewhere ectothermic, and maybe somewhere something in between, like sort of warm blooded. Um, so there you go. We're not sure. Now what about dinosaur parenting? Um, Typically, um, reptiles do not parent their young so much. They, they lay a nest and kind of, that, that's that, let, let the young fend for themselves, typically. Um, and dinosaurs are reptiles, so they do lay eggs like typical reptiles. But um, some nests that dinosaurs have laid are covered with vegetation, sort of like uh, crocodile nests are. What happens is the decaying vegetation, as it decays, it gives off some heat, and it's that vegetation that provides heat for incubation. So that would suggest that these dinosaurs behave more like, uh, like crocodiles that um, basically lay their eggs and go on their merry way. But um, it is some, some areas, like uh, in, in Argentina and South America, there's a huge nesting ground of titanosaurs. And this suggests like some birds all get together at a nesting ground. Like you'll have gannet colonies and, and birds like that and they all lay their eggs in this one area. Uh, it looks like titanosaurs had that same strategy. They all got together in this big area and laid their eggs. And uh, why this is a good strategy is all the young will then hatch at about the same time and there are lots and lots of young dinosaurs then and the idea is predators aren't going to be able to get them all. So some of those young dinosaurs are going to be able to live and uh, produce the next generation of dinosaurs. That's a really interesting place to go is this nesting ground in Argentina. Um, because you can be uh, walking around in the desert down there and every rock you're stepping on is a piece of a dinosaur egg. It's just littering the ground everywhere. And why this was preserved was these titanosaurs uh, did not understand natural hazards. Their nesting ground was in a floodplain and the river ended up flooding and um, uh, covered this uh, uh, nesting ground, buried it all in sediment, and that's why it got preserved for us to go and see today. Now, in uh, Montana, there's some hadrosaur nests that have partially grown juveniles, which does suggest that uh, the parents stuck around and the juveniles would like hang around the nest and the parents would like bring them food and things. So it does seem like some dinosaurs at least um, would uh, parent their young. And probably the most interesting indication of parenting in dinosaurs is Oviraptor. Now, uh, this um, Oviraptor was found in Mongolia and uh, it was found incubating a nest like a bird. So this oviraptor was actually sitting on its nest, incubating and uh, protecting its eggs. Now, the reason it gets the name oviraptor, raptor means thief, and ova refer refers to eggs. And when uh, scientists first discovered this back in the 1930s, they thought that this dinosaur was stealing the eggs from the nest, thus they called it egg thief. 
But then as um, paleontologists got better technology and they were able to do things like CAT scan the eggs and stuff, they were like, wait a minute, it's little mini oviraptors that are in the eggs. This dinosaur is not stealing the eggs, it's protecting and incubating the eggs. So anyway, there's the actual fossil that's found. There you can see the claws of the raptor um, and it's almost kind of sitting over top its nest is sort of clutching and holding those eggs nicely in place. Here's um, a uh, artist's rendition of what that looks like or would have looked like. Um, that's over raptor. There is its young. I do happen to think it's interesting that Isis uh, provided this artwork. And who knew that terrorists were such good artists? No, I'm kidding. I, I'm hoping that Isis is referring to the Egyptian god, uh, not, or was it goddess? Goddess, um, not the terrorists. But anyway, that is a nice artist rendition of Over Raptor on its nest. All right, so that's dinosaur parenting, which it seems some dinosaurs were pretty good parents and some um, weren't. Um, let's move on to other reptiles. We're going to move away from the dinosaurs into the other reptiles that were prominent and were ruling parts of the Mesozoic world. Um, pterosaurs are flying reptiles, but they are not dinosaurs. Now, pterosaurs, um, well, flying reptiles, and I put flying in quotes, um, appear in the Permian, but these were actually probably gliders. They probably did not actually fly. They're more like flying squirrels that sort of leap from tree to tree and, and kind of, but glide along the way. And these uh, Permian ones would look sort of like this, right? It's where we have these kind of primitive wings and, and that's our glider of the Permian. But we get true flying reptiles in the late Triassic and they exist all the way into the Cretaceous. And these guys have, for their size, relatively large brains. And it's thought that they needed bigger brains because they are not living in a two-dimensional world. When you think about it, those of us who are stuck on the ground have to think in you know, basically two dimensions, right? Um, these guys can fly, so they're going up and down as well as, you know, forward, backward, side to side. And it's thought they needed a larger brain to uh, kind of comprehend this, this very three-dimensional world and make the motions and changes needed uh, during flight. Uh, some actually appear to have primitive hair on them. A good example of this is this little guy here. This guy's name is Sordus Pilosus. Uh, which uh, translates into hairy devil or hairy demon, something like that. You can see he's got like little hairs kind of behind uh, his head and on his belly. And that's how big he would be. I think this is another one of those animals I would love to have as a pet. I'd just like to walk around class with my little demon on my shoulder. Um, all right, but in pterosaurs, there are two types of pterosaurs. Uh, we have the Ramphorhynchoids, which are the earlier ones. These exist from the Triassic to the Jurassic, and they have a long tail with a vein on the tip of the tail that probably helped them steer. And that's what we're seeing right here. There's that long vein on the uh, tail, or the long tail with the vein on the end of it. Now notice in these guys the way their wings are structured. It's a little bit different than other flying organisms. In pterosaurs, the um, wings, um, the majority of the wing is supported on the pinky. This is the pinky finger right there. There's its three middle fingers. And so this giant pinky kind of supported the whole wing. And that's different from birds, which actually have some fused bones that support the wing. And in bats, the wing is supported between all five fingers. Anyway, this is a, uh, a Ramphorhynchoid. You can see again, it's not the biggest thing around, but you know, it's uh, a nice flying uh, reptile there. Now, we also have the pterodactyloids. And the pterodactyloids exist from the late Jurassic into the Cretaceous. 
And these guys have no tails or maybe a short little stubby tail. And these guys are the descendants of the Rhamphorhynchoids. So we're just sort of seeing the evolution of these pterosaurs. And a great example of one of these um, is Quetzalcoatlus. This was the largest of the flying reptiles that it ever existed. And it was also a Texas native. Bones of uh, Quetzalcoatlus were discovered out in Big Bend country. And its name comes from the uh, one of the Aztec gods who was a feathered serpent. So that's where it gets its name from. And so this is uh, what they uh, would have looked like. Again, you can see their arms and there's that massive pinky. And this is how big Quetzalcoatlus could get. And that's actually a lower estimate. They might have actually grown even larger than that. And this is, of course, comparing it to our six foot tall person. 